See, this, this is our generation, your guys' generation is starting to be known as the snobbish generation, and that's Gen Z, which is, I'm just an individual, and I get everything I want because what I have done for me and I. So yeah, my parents brought me into this world, but eh, it was really me, I'm a self-made man or woman. See, that's, that's the opposite of thanking God. Thanking God is, no, I wasn't just born as an accident, I didn't just get lucky. You actually had a purpose for me and have a purpose for me in this world. I think it's uh, intellectually dishonest to use, say, other phys uh, philosophical ideologies like Stoicism to reinforce or like bounce off of Christianity. Yeah, Stoicism glorifies ultimately the suffering. So your purpose in life is simply to get over suffering. And so you've got so many different talking heads on TikTok now, where you have the, whether it's David Goggins or others who are saying, you know, they just drop the F word nonstop and say, oh yeah, suffering, F that. You know, at the same time, it's kind of a good thing. And I'm just going to transcend this type of suffering. It's Stoicism. It's a modern day type of Stoicism. Back in Jesus' time period, you had Stoicism and Epicureanism. And Stoicism was the same kind of thing. It was grin it and bear it, white knuckle it, get through this difficult life, find meaning and purpose in the suffering, be masochistic, and that's where ultimately your purpose lies. Epicureanism was, no, you just live for pleasure. So Dave Matthews talks about drink up, live this hedonistic, sorry, Dave Matthews, I'm kind of dating myself. That was when I was like younger than you guys. And he talked about be merry, live for the now in the most pleasurable way possible, for tomorrow we die. And we get that in almost every genre of music, right? That's just modern day hedonism. And so those were the two strands of thought alongside of what Jesus taught in the early Roman Empire. So what does Paul talk about in Romans 5, 3 through 5? Yes, we grow through our sufferings, in character, hope, closeness with God. So suffering can be a great thing, but don't find your meaning and purpose in the suffering itself. Uh, Philippians 1, uh, Paul says that he rejoices in the gospel being spread, whether it be with bad intentions or good intentions. And we have picketers come to campus uh, who preach and scream and spit about uh, how bad abortion is and how sin sinful we are, um, but they're still preaching the gospel. How do we find joy in that? Well, just going over this passage and leading a, a big group of people at our church, oddly enough, so it's fascinating that you ask this question. And so what does the context talk about? Well, if you look into that passage, it's about those who have ill will and those who are puffing themselves up in sharing the gospel. Okay, that's pretty sad, pretty pathetic. If people are going to be Christians and they're going to simply be Christians, talking about Christ, preaching about Christ, to get a following, to make money, to be competitive and combative, like, come on, get a different job, like, like, get a different career path. And sadly, all of us, though, out here, I'd say every Christian out here, sure, their pride gets in, involved at different times. But the fire and brimstone preachers that you have on campuses, don't forget, they started the great revivals where we come from on the East Coast just a couple hundred years ago where thousands and thousands of people were coming to believe in God because they felt a God-shaped hole and they were convicted and felt that there was, they had guilty consciences and that there was heaven out there. And so, yes, I believe those who scream at people, <laughs> sure, there's some ill will involved, but they're also focusing on certain passages of the Bible that, yes, are hard to swallow and digest, and yet at the same time, God can use those people. But for us, it makes our job very, very challenging here on university campuses because people will scatter who are non-believers typically, and say, ah, oh, here comes another fire and brimstone teacher telling us all that we're just so-and-so and going to hell. So God can use anybody as long as the gospel is preached, I believe, and yet at the same time, we do need to be wise in terms of preaching both sides of the gospel, that we are sinful, more sinful than we can ever even grapple with, and yet more loved than we ever could imagine. So preach both sides of the gospel and do so by emptying yourself daily, understanding, like 2 Corinthians talks about, we're all broken vessels and jars of clay. So knowing that gives us humility in talking about the gospel. Can you be openly gay and openly indulging in, in gay pleasures whilst knowing it says in the Bible not to be gay? Does doing that and knowing something from the Bible to be true but rejecting it, 
would that exclude you from heaven? The gospel always starts with grace. So if I'm living a lifestyle where I'm really trying not to curse, I'm really trying not to sleep with a man or a woman, I'm really trying just to be a better, better person each and every day. Well, Jesus talked about the Pharisees and that they were the furthest from him because they were living that type of lifestyle. Don't forget, they were living in such a way where they were tithing the most for social justice, all these great things. And yet inside, inside the cup, they were filled with pride, with all different types of wrong, ill motives. So firstly, it's all about God's grace. Through Jesus Christ dying on the cross for us, that's what saves us. So to this good question, you always have to start with the gospel. But then, secondly, and more and closer to your good question, if I'm out here gossiping about somebody, if I gossip many, many times every single day, I need to start to seriously look at myself and ask myself, am I really a Christian? Because what is a Christian? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Well, if I'm just blasting people left and right, which is very juicy, by the way, it's very easy to spill tea and to sip tea. And by doing so, though, we start to create this habit in our minds and our hearts and not loving people <coughs> genuinely at all. So there are so many different types of sins that can slip into us that, yes, I believe can ultimately turn us away from really wanting God and really wanting to love our neighbor. But even closer to your good question, whether it's heterosexuality or homosexuality, if I'm living a promiscuous lifestyle outside of marriage, porneia, Jesus uses, was all about, yes, marrying somebody, having a covenantal relationship with them throughout life between a man and a woman, and having children, if, if you could, and protecting those children within the family unit. Not living a promiscuous lifestyle where a, a man in the Roman Empire could have multiple wives, and literally they were all his sex slaves. Okay, it was to protect women. That was largely a big part of why a male and a female were to get married. And it wasn't supposed to be a male and a male. More so even than just homosexuality broadly, you had pedophilia going on. Because every single man could have numerous young boys that they wanted to sleep with and do whatever they wanted to do with. And yet again, that porneo word gets back to what is the reason for marriage? Why do we have marriage? Partly to protect every single woman in that day and age to protect children and then to have this incredible flourishing covenantal relationship that God could use to change this world. So it's any sin, whether it's heterosexual or homosexual, if I'm living that out on a daily basis, know it's sinful and wrong and don't turn from it, then yes, it's hard to say that I'm living a genuine Christian lifestyle. But lastly, Jordan Peterson don't get caught up in his thinking. I, I love the guy. I think he's got some great stuff on Christianity and God. But don't forget, he says, don't become a Christian unless you can live out the lifestyle perfectly. Okay, what does First John talk about? If we do not sin, we make him and ourselves out to be liars. We're going to sin every single day. So don't come to Christianity and say, oh, I'm going to come into it really slowly and carefully with a lot of trepidation because I... I I just don't know. I'm not going to be able to live it out. No, it's by God's grace firstly. And then, like your good question, yes, recognize those sins. Turn away from them. Repent and change by God's freedom because he has your best in store for you. And that's how you live a life of flourishing and great change for yourself and society. Can a practicing homosexual go to heaven is I do not know. What I do know is it is wrong to live in adultery. It is wrong to fornicate. It's wrong to feast on pornography. It is wrong to lust. And it is wrong to live in a homosexual relationship because God created us male and female. And in Genesis 2.24 we read, For this reason, reason a man shall leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. But exactly who's a genuine Christian? I do not know. Exactly who is a hypocrite? I do not know. And that's why I'm not going to do the judging. God, who's all knowing, will judge. And in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will come to me on that day of my return and say, Lord, Lord, do we not perform miracles, cast out demons? Then I will tell them plainly, I 
never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So who's a genuine Christian? I do not know, because I don't know your heart, and guess what? For all you know, somebody could be paying Stuart and me a lot of money to be out here. We could be flaming hypocrites, for all you know. You don't really know us, right? So we could be flaming phonies. So you see, you really don't know, do you? That's why on the Day of Judgment, it's, I'm very grateful that it's going to be an all-knowing, all-loving God who's going to be doing the judging. Thanks for raising that tremendous question. For passages like Acts 2, 30 through 39, uh, that seem to imply that infants are saved through the sacrament of baptism, what would you make of those passages, and how would you understand them? All right. Matthew chapter 25 says, Unless you feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit those who are sick and in prison, Christ is going to say, sorry, never knew you. Does that mean that Jesus is saying the way to heaven is to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, and to visit those who are sick and in prison? No, you've got to read in context. In context, by reading the Gospels and the letters of Paul, it's clear that we go to heaven because we put our faith, our trust in Jesus Christ. But if that faith is genuine, it will be shown by him and me, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting those who are sick and in prison. And if he and I say, don't have the time, don't have the interest, you're a loser, sorry, homeless guy, that's the way it goes. We're hypocrites. So we go on to communion. <coughs> Jesus says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. Does that mean that communion, the Eucharist, is the way to heaven? No, sir. Communion is done in obedience to Christ. What about sexual morality? Is the way to heaven to live a sexually pure life? No, sir. The way to heaven is to put your faith in Christ. But if your faith is in Christ, you will celebrate communion and you will seek to live a sexually pure life. And the same is true for baptism. So watch out for people who tell you that baptism, you have to be baptized to go to heaven. No, you don't have to be baptized to go to heaven. You go to heaven by putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Then, because your faith is in him, you better be baptized. You better take communion. You better feed the hungry and clothe the naked. You better live a sexually pure life. Why? If I say, Jesus, I am willing to obey you if. He's not Lord. He's an advisor in my life. Jesus does not come as an advisor. He comes as Lord. Which means when he says something, because my faith is in him, I will struggle to obey him. Of course, my problem is at times I disobey. Too frequently I disobey. And that's why this faith walk is a lifelong process of growing in that faith. How do you have good discretion when it comes to God? Like even, even when you read in scripture, like, cause it's a difference between perception and perspective. And I wanna know how would you go into actually knowing when you're talking to God, having a relationship, forming it? You're gonna hear people all the time say, oh, it's just science out here, right? I believe in science, I don't believe in God. I believe you need God in order to do good science. Cause I believe you need a personal logical, which comes from philosophy. See, science came from philosophy. People don't realize that. It's called natural theology, even. Natural philosophy. That's what science came out of, and that was largely based off of what, in the West, a few hundred years ago, those who st started modern science, so you have the Keplers and then the Galileos, they were all Christians who started it. And so understanding, firstly, when it comes to God and a relationship with God, you can truly have one because it's not just about science and just proof, proof, proof. Instead, it's understanding there are so many things in this world that we don't have proof of that we have to have faith and belief in in order to really, truly trust it. See, when I was flying here from Atlanta, I just kept looking at the wings of my plane because I know there's been a few plane crashes in the last six months with wings literally being taken off the plane just because of different malfunctions. And I'm thinking, this is a lot of faith for me to be on this airplane right now. A lot of faith it takes. And yet we all do it. Even scientists who live by proof, they'll take plane rides all the time. That's a lot of faith. 
So understanding when I come to a relationship with God, yes, there's going to be faith, faith involved, but there's faith in me doing experiments in the science lab that there are certain controls that I have to believe in that will continue to work in order to do good science. So more specifically to your great question, starting there, understanding it's faith. I'm not going to connect with God usually out of my five senses, touch, taste, smell. I'm going to connect with God through his word, through the gospels, where you can actually get to know Jesus Christ, who lived, died, and rose from the dead, and that through his Holy Spirit, unless, unless Jesus left, we wouldn't be able to have the same connection with God. And one who is greater than I, just like John the Baptist said of Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit, which is even greater because the Holy Spirit can reach all of us. If Jesus was still here as a historical, physical figure, he wouldn't be able to reach all of us. He, he just wouldn't. And so that's why when we get that the Holy Spirit was greater in the sense of he can reach all of you when you do sit down, pray to God, pray to the Holy Spirit that he is in you and changing you right here, right now. So start with the Gospels, looking at Christ. Then say, Holy Spirit, I want you to fill me. Take away my anxiety. Take away my stress. Take away my pain that I'm feeling. Be with my loved ones. Change the hearts of those who don't believe in you. So pray and access the Holy Spirit in that way. Pray to God the Father through the Lord's Prayer. But if you really sift the Lord's Prayer, it becomes really simple through A-C-T-S. And that's A, adoration. God, what am I adoring you for? Your attributes. So you're unconditionally loving. There's nothing I can do that separates me from your love, Romans chapter 8 talks about. Secondly, C, confessing. What do I have to confess? Not gossiping about somebody. Uh, lusting. I mean, it's very easy for me to think about the sins that I could confess for. T, so that's A-C, T, thanking God. I, I try and have this as a spiritual discipline every night when I go to bed, to thank God as much as possible for the small things and the large things in life that I receive. See, this, this is our generation, your guys' generation, is starting to be known as the snobbish generation, and that's Gen Z, which is, I'm just an individual, and I get everything I want because what I have done for me and I. So yeah, my parents brought me into this world, but eh, it was really me. I'm a self-made man or woman. See, that's, that's the opposite of thanking God. Thanking God is, no, I wasn't just born as an accident. I didn't just get lucky. You actually had a purpose for me and have a purpose for me in this world. And then finally, S, don't get caught up on the S because it's a big word, supplication. All that means is asking God for things. See, I have many friends who say, oh, I never ask God for things that are connected to myself. Well, you, you're told to actually. You're told to ask God for your own personal health, for the health of others. You're told to ask God to show himself more in your life. So A, adore God. C, confess what you've done wrong. T, thank God. And then S, supplication, which is asking God. If you go through praying the Gospels, understanding who Christ is more, asking the Holy Spirit to fill you, and then going through something like the Lord's Prayer and talking to God that way, it's impossible not to grow a healthy relationship with God. But why do we ask him for things to happen whenever he already knows what's gonna happen? Because prayer is mainly for us to conform our wills to God's, not God to ours. And so the vast majority of the reason why we get in the gospels, as well as for our lives hopefully, is to say, God, change me. I wanna to get to know you, the God of the universe. I don't need you to be my secretary. I oftentimes treat you like my secretary because I only pray to you when I have a case of the ASCIIs. When I just ask, 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 send up flares and God just do this for me and then maybe I believe in you or maybe I believe you're a good God because of it. Oddly enough, that only causes more anxiety. We often think if I ask God for things and he gives me something, oh, now I have peace. That typically, if you just have a routine in prayer of asking God for things, all studies show that it causes more anxiety. So I wouldn't pray if I were you, if you're just going to be asking God for things, because that's also using God. Have you ever had a friend who feels like all they do is ask you for things and it's all about them? I mean, how, how disappointing a relationship is that? You want somebody who's also asking and giving you things. There's a give and take, because so much of friendship is, I'm gonna sacrifice for you and care more so for you than you do for me. And that's why, the art of conversation, so much of it comes down to asking questions. Asking questions, but the reason why we do so is because I want to get to know you better. So when you ask God, don't start off just asking God for things, but ask God for, God, how do I get to know you better? 
That's the whole purpose of life, to glorify God and to edify others. Then lastly, it's about us. That's why Rick Warren in his best-selling book of all time here in the U.S. starts out with those words, it's not about you. So when you come to God in prayer, yes, he already knows what will happen, but understand you're going to him and he will bless you with things that you ask for, absolutely. But the primary purpose is, God, I want to get to know you, to glorify you, that's the purpose of this whole life, and then to help grow others and to love others and make them better. That's the, that's the purpose. Great question. Yes? I was just wondering, what is the best way to stay motivated in your relationship with God and reading the Bible and praying and all of that when you don't necessarily feel them? Because I know that there are seasons of your life where you can go a couple weeks and you'll really feel the presence of the Lord. And then just like, I mean, it's not necessarily cut off, but like you feel like you don't feel him anymore. Mm. So how do you go about that season of not feeling the Lord after you felt him so strongly? So one time I was counseling a woman who said, hey, look, I had this vibrant relationship with God, but then all of a sudden I hit the skids in such a way where I didn't feel the wind in my back anymore. I didn't feel his presence. I didn't hear his voice. And now I don't believe in God. And she was crying. And I felt so much pain for her because I saw the joy that she had and now this depression that she had. Now, I think our mental health and our faith and spirituality are completely intermingled in a very positive way. But there's a negative side to it. Because I've also seen other people who are chewed up with the emotion of anger at God because of certain things that have happened in their life. And they still believe in him. And yet they hate him. And they're so angry with him. And they plead with us, hey, take this away. I want to know God and love him yet again. But I just can't. And so for this first woman who was dealing with depression, she put too much stock in these feelings and the emotional connection with God. Because all of us are not just emotional beings. We are nuanced, complex, emotional, and intellectual, physical beings. And so what, what is it, like 95% at some point of people will hit a depression in their life, whether that's young or when you're really old and sedentary? Well, are you gonna ditch your faith because you don't feel God's presence then? No, I hope you're like King David who said to himself three times in Psalm 42 and 43 alone, why are you downcast and depressed, O my soul? Why so disturbed and anxious within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my Lord. He's saying I'm depressed. He's saying I'm anxious. He's saying my son's after me to kill me. He's saying this king's after me because he's jealous and envious and he wants to kill me. He's saying my family's taking off. He's saying I've made these mistakes of adultery and murder myself. Okay, he has every single reason to be anxious and depressed, and yet he falls back on the promises of God, that God will be with him, and that God has a future for him, and it's not about his own guilt, feelings, or shame, or what he's done. It's not about his own isolation and separation. He had this close, close friend, Jonathan, that he had, no longer has even that relationship anymore, and yet he still falls back on the promises of God, the character of God, which is all just, all caring, all loving, and knows that will propel him. But I would not say he's feeling this type of happiness in his relationship with God at this time. I would not say that he has this strong faith at this time like you see elsewhere in his life. No, he's filled with doubts. He's filled with these emotions that are all over the place. So, why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope, always relocate your hope in who God is and his promises and know that you're going to go through emotions that are high and low, but don't base your relationship with God on those emotions, base them primarily on his promises. Is spiritual warfare and mental illness the same thing or does it overlap? So in the Greek you have something called kissed by the moon that a lot of Christians don't know about. So oftentimes kissed by the moon is connected with somebody like Legion who was filled with, Legion means many of us, many different demons. And so the exorcism of, for example, another demon-possessed man, where the demons go into the pigs, and the pigs fall off the side of the cliff and die, and then Jesus gets in serious trouble with the townspeople because all their money was in these pigs. And you have just this ruckus, you have this major issue. Kissed by the moon from a mental health standpoint, there's a reason why when there's a full moon, those who are schizophrenic and bipolar have a way higher percentage chance of going manic and having a psychotic break. That makes sense, and all of modern psychiatry looks at that and says, 
okay, if you go back to ancient history, and when ancients talk about being kissed by the moon, that is a mental health issue, where they were noticing it too. You know, we, we know the vast majority of crime even happens when there's a full moon out. So it's fascinating how the gospel writers were ahead of their time, because they were some of the first ones who talked about this, when, not every single time, but there are specific times when you have demon possession and the gospel writers saying, this person was kissed by the moon. So when I go into a psych unit, I worked at Mass General Hospital, for example, and I'm looking at somebody who is just off the wall crazy. I look at them and say, okay, most likely there is a neurochemical issue here, whether it's from their own heritable genetics, whether it's from an environmental issue, whatever it might be. If medication does not help, if therapy doesn't help, then I start to look at there could be a demonic possession going on here. But the problem that I find with Christians in hopping quickly to this person is demon possessed is you scare the living daylights out of that person and it makes things 10 times worse usually because they don't know for sure if they're demon possessed and how do you control that? Are you going to get an exorcist in? Is that exorcist, did they really help me or not? Do I still have that demon? As opposed to something like medication, especially in the cases of schizophrenia and bipolar, usually helps like that. So the biblical authors were ahead of their time in understanding what is kissed by the moon that so many of these places are mental illness, break down physically and psychologically, but there's also demonic possession going on. And we see that. Just read M. Scott Peck. Just read some of these great psychiatrists who weren't necessarily Christians, but believed in the supernatural and in God. And they said the level of evil that they saw in their psychiatry with different people and how they were just going off the walls mentally, they said there was probably some spiritual darkness going on. So even those who are not Christians or don't even believe in God, many will, who have MDs, who are in psychiatric offices, will say, I can't explain this. I can't explain this from simply a materialistic medical perspective. And so atheists have a tough time with that one. They have to figure out what's going on there that's beyond just medical and neurochemical. Is that nature? Is it, is it your own physical makeup? Is it you're stuck in a dead end job and you hate your parents? or somebody else, and so you're chewed up with anger, which is causing that depression? Is it, I'm not exercising, I'm not sleeping, I don't have a good diet, that can cause depression, or is it spiritual? Is it a spirit where there's definitely some type of connection? You look at, for example, Saul in the Bible. You look at, even better example would be Cain, right? Sin is crouching at your door, Cain, and you must master it. Okay, sin is crouching. That's oppression, it's coming from the outside. That wasn't sin inside Cain. Yes, it was there as well, but God is saying, you better watch out. There is sin crouching like a tiger at your door. You must master it. And then what does Cain do? He's so jealous of his brother that he is downcast, the text says, depressed, and just looks down at the ground all the time. And God says, does it do you well, Cain, to be downcast? Why are you even downcast and have the spirit of depression? And it's because he's jealous. So oftentimes de the spirit of depression can come on because we're, de we're tremendously jealous and envious of somebody else. So yes, there can be a spiritual side, and I think there typically always is, whether it's physical or mental health, but there's also usually more things going on as well. I'd like to invite you to Grace Community Church, located at 365 Lukeswood Road in New Canaan, Connecticut. Our services are at 9.30 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. on Sundays. Hope you can join us.